Hello, welcome to my video on the Lac Operon. So let's get started. Basically, the Lac Operon is a thing in E. coli. Here's like a little E. coli dude. The goal of these guys is obviously to live. The E. coli that live get to pass on their genes. The E. coli that don't, uh, don't. They don't pass on their genes, they die. And so E. coli basically needs to be as efficient as possible in getting resources in order to survive. And it can do this through eating sugars. And so it eats these, it like absorbs them and digests them and it digests them using digesting proteins, which break the sugars apart, and these enzymes are produced by genes. So the E. coli basically wants to produce the appropriate enzymes depending on what sugar is present in its environment. And this is where the Lac operon comes in. The Lac operon is a section of DNA. Here's some DNA that basically codes for the enzymes that digest lactose. It codes for these enzymes. These enzymes then go break apart lactose, and lactose is a disaccharide, which means it has basically two monomers. Oh look, they're broken apart. Woo, they did it. And then lactose can be utilized for nutrients. Obviously, it wouldn't want to just produce these proteins constantly because producing proteins takes energy. It wants to make these digesting proteins only when lactose is there and only when lactose is the best option. If there is a monosaturide like glucose, it will want to digest this instead because that takes less energy to digest. And so it basically needs to have two things. Like it needs to see, is there lactose in the environment? If there is no lactose, it's stupid to produce these enzymes because they're not gonna be able to do anything. You're just wasting energy. And two, is is glucose not in the environment? Because if glucose is there, it wouldn't want to produce these enzymes either. It would want to produce the glucose digesting enzymes because that takes less energy to get the same amount of nutrients. So how can the cell tell when there's lactose and when there's glucose? And then how does it use that signal to basically change what proteins it produces? It does so through gene regulation. So let's look at the lac operon. Here's like a section of DNA. And the lac operon has three genes, three structural genes, which are lac Z, lac Y, and lac A. This isn't really important. Then there's the promoter. We'll label that with a P. And this is where the RNA polymerase binds. So normally the RNA polymerase will bind here and then express these genes. But there's another site. Now I'll redraw everything. There's a site called the operator. And it's a section of DNA basically next to the promoter. And the operator is where a protein called the repressor binds and the repressor is coded by a gene basically just behind this whole mess and the repressor is called lac i so a repressor is produced by this protein all right so i'm saying this word repressor a lot but what does a repressor even do well it, it's kind of in the name it represses it stops genes from being expressed and how it does that is it physically stops rnap from doing its job so let's say the repressor is produced it is going to come over and bind to the operator and just stay there it's like i am chilling you cannot move me an rnap comes and it binds to the promoter and then it's like wait a minute there is this guy literally in my way preventing me from doing my job. I cannot reach these genes. I cannot express them. I can't do anything. And so the repressor just stops the RNAP from doing anything. He's pretty upset about that. And so you're like, okay, so it makes this repressor to stop its genes from being expressed. And, and this kind of makes sense because most of the time you're not going to need to digest lactose. You're only going to need to digest lactose when there is lactose basically in the environment. Let's say that there is lactose in the environment. And here's all the little lactose molecules. They're pretty small. And this repressor is chilling on the operator. And then, say there's such a high concentration of lactose, one of them collides. One of them comes close to the repressor and hits it. And the repressor, if we look at it closely, I mean, we can imagine like it has little hands to grab the DNA. That's kind of weird. But so like it grabs the DNA down here. Like that's one domain of it or one section of it. But then it also has this spot back here, which is a binding site for lactose. So the lactose comes in and binds to it. And what happens is when the lactose is bound to that site, the protein changes shape and can no longer bind to the DNA. So it literally lets go of the DNA. It's like, oh my gosh, I've just been changed shape. Like I can't do anything oh my gosh like this you can kind of imagine it as the lactose comes and bites the repressor and this startles it and now it's like oh my gosh like there's lactose and so it lets go of the dna and now that repressor is gone the repressor is bound here and any other repressors that are produced also get bound to by lactose so the lactose comes in and it's like hey we're gonna stop all these repressors from binding and now rnap is like this is my chance i can come in and transcribe these genes no problem because there is 
no repressor in my way. So perfect. So when there is lactose, the repressor is forced to let go of the DNA and it cannot physically block the RNAP from doing its job. So that's pretty cool. But what if there's also glucose? We in this situation kind of assumed that lactose was the only thing there. And there is another site that we need to talk about. There's the genes. I'm going to be drawing these a lot. Here's the operator. Here's the promoter. We got the repressor. And then there is also this. There's another site called the cap site. So what you need to know is there is this protein called cap. In our worksheets, it's drawn like this. It's drawn like a little kind of like arrow looking guy. Cap, and it stands for catabolite. Oh my gosh, how do I spell this? Catabolite activator protein. And for most of the time, it is bound to the cap site. And that's because there's another little guy called CAMP, which stands for cyclic adenosine monophosphate. And these guys are normally bound together. They are best buds. And together, they can bind to the cap site. And they act as an activator for the RNAP. So this guy is like, hey, come on, everything's good. I'm going to help you bind. And it does this by bending the DNA a little bit to make this promoter a lot more accessible. So then this guy is like, hey, thanks man, I could not have done that without you. The And the cap and camp are like, no problem. We are the greatest team helping to get this operon transcribed. But then you can kind of imagine it that like, like there's a lot of camp in the cytoplasm. Then let's say that all of a sudden there is glucose. Glucose is just an absolute jerk. Glucose comes in and is like, nah. And through a bunch of regulatory mechanisms, when glucose is high, cyclic AMP is low. And if since we're going about kind of personifying all these processes, we can imagine that the cyclic AMP is literally scared of glucose. So they're like, yeah, we're getting out of here. This is nope, because literally they're not being produced. These guys stop their production. But if you want to think about it in a kind of more fun way, you can think that like whenever these guys are here, these are nowhere to be found, absolute cowards. And when they're not here, the cat protein is like, hey, what's going on? I need you to bind to this cap site. And so this guy can't find any cyclic AMP to help him bind. These guys are not here. They're not being produced produced because they're just too scared of the glucose. And so CAP cannot bind to the CAP site. And then RNAP comes along and is like, hey, I thought you were going to help me bind onto this promoter. Like, I need you. And the CAP is like, I'm, I can't do anything. I'm sorry, I don't have cyclic AMP. So the RNAP cannot bind. None of these genes are gonna be expressed. None of these proteins are gonna be produced. So let's review what happens. Let's say that there is no lactose and no glucose. No glucose is good. That means there's a lot of cyclic AMP a lot of camp, which then means that the cap protein can bind to the cap site, which then means RNAP can bind to the promoter. If we draw this out, there's a bunch of camp floating around. They're vibing because there's no glucose. They're like, this is awesome. And so then they work together. Here's them best buds to bind here. And they're like, oh my gosh, dude, everything's perfect. There's no glucose. Come and bind to the promoter. This is awesome. But there's also no lactose. And no lactose means that the repressor is not stopped. Remember, lactose binds to the repressor to make it not bind to the DNA. So the repressor is like, oh, there's no lactose. Nothing is stopping me. Nothing is literally biting me and making me fall off the DNA. I can be here on the operator, which then means that RNAP cannot transcribe the genes. And so then he's like, oh my gosh, you are blocking me. I cannot get over here to these genes. I cannot transcribe them. And so in total, the lac operon is not expressed. And then let's say that there was glucose. So if it's it's no lactose glucose, this would actually make it even worse because there wouldn't be any cyclic AMP. So no camp, then cap can't bind. And so then RNAP can't bind to the DNA. So RNAP can't even get on, it's over here. And because there's no lactose, the repressor is bound. So there's a repressor, basically everything is going horribly and the genes cannot be expressed. And by genes, I mean the lac operon. Now let's say that there is lactose and there is a glucose. The lactose, means that the repressor can't bind. So the repressor is kind of like, hey, I am being bitten by lactose, remember? I am freaking out. It is changing my shape and I can no longer bind to the DNA. So the repressor is no longer a problem. The operator site is open. Everything is great. Except since there's a lot of glucose, there is no cyclic AMP, which means cap cannot bind and 
RNA key also cannot bind. So even though the repressor isn't blocking it, they still can't transcribe it. And this all makes sense why this wouldn't work. If there's no lactose, there would be no reason to produce lactose digesting proteins. If there's no lactose and there's glucose, not only do you not need to digest lactose because it isn't even there, glucose is a way better option. And finally, if there is lactose but there's also glucose, sure, you could digest the lactose, but glucose is such a better option, you don't want to waste your energy messing around with this lactose. And so the final thing would have to be lactose and no glucose. No glucose means that there's a lot of cyclic AMP, which means that the cap protein can bind. Lactose means that the repressor cannot bind. The repressor is off here. Oh my gosh, he's just having a terrible day. Uh, he cannot bind. His hand's literally broken. And so the operator, there's nothing bound to the operator. Nothing is stopping RNAP. So camp is like, hey, I'm here to help you. You can now load. And it does. And then there's nothing blocking it. And it can now finally transcribe these genes, produce these proteins, and digest this lactose. So I hope that that helps helped your understanding with the lac operon.